series, and it, this series is going to be so good. I, I'm not preaching, but I want to, uh, I want to read a passage for you uh, under Matthew 5, verse 1 to 10. Matthew 5, verse 1 to 10. The words are on your screen right now. So let me just read that for you. Verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God. Amen. And now, I just want to welcome to the stage our very own senior pastor, Pastor Philip Lin. Come on, give him a hand. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Oh, how great is it to be in the house of God. Somebody say an amen to that. Whether you're listening to us here on site or online, you're part of this great, great family called Skyline. You matter to us. We love you. And we pray that you will truly be blessed by God's word and this wonderful community you're part of from wherever in the world or whichever city you're listening from. This morning, we begin a new Sunday series from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7. And they collectively are known as the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this is, we believe, a collection of teachings by Jesus uh, over a course of time. Uh, we don't quite believe that it was actually given all in one sitting because the 107 verses spread over three chapters are so power-packed that if you were to sit down and just listen to them in one sitting, it would virtually overwhelm you. It's like drinking from a fire hose. And the second reason why we believe that these were uh, separate discourses collected over a period of time is because that segments of the Sermon on the Mount actually uh, are sometimes a little bit disconnected. So we know that there were probably breaks uh, in between. And today, I'd like to do an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps the greatest sermon in history, and particularly talk about, uh, in the time that I have, the introduction to the Beatitudes this morning. And it's going to be an exciting time. Over the next few weeks, few months, then uh, we just course through together the Sermon on the Mount. Firstly, let's address this fundamental question. Who is the Sermon on the Mount addressed to? Well, it's addressed to Christians. How do we know? Because the first verse says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So we know that there was a huge crowd following Jesus. And to get away from the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And the guys who were prepared to go up to the top of the mountain to struggle to get, they were the ones who got the full teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. His disciples came to him and he sat down. Now the word sat down there actually uh, is, is a word in traditional rabbinical teaching that means teaching with authority. That's a traditional posture a rabbi or a teacher taught. And it is from this whole picture of sitting down that to get, today we get the picture of uh, the word chair, which is used for somebody who holds the post of a professor in a university. That's where it's come down. Why do we call a person who holds a professorship in a university a chair? Uh, of that particular, uh, you know, course, because it carries academic authority. So when a rabbi sits down, it carries authority. And it is the same when the Pope pronounces from the Vatican, the latest doctrine or teaching to the Roman Catholic Church, he is making a pro proclamation, ex cathedra. And it comes from a Latin word which means from a chair, from a chair, which actually then brings me to a, a moot point perhaps, but it's an important point. Why do pastors preach standing? <laughs> um, let's move on, okay, from here. Uh, but let me tell you about, you know, uh, why this is so important for us. Because it says that when, when Jesus started teaching, it tells us that he opened his mouth 
and taught his disciples, saying. Now, on first glance, when you read this sentence, it looks as though this is vain repetition. This is just decorative language. Why do you say, you know, when somebody wants to teach, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. I mean, how do you teach with speech if you don't open your mouth, right? It's like I say to somebody, you know, and, you know, he sat down to eat. And he sat down to open his mouth to eat, biting and chewing. I mean, it's like, I don't need to say biting and chewing and opening his mouth to eat. You just say he sat down to eat. So, so why is this language like that? What does it actually mean? Is this just vain repetition or what? After all, you need a mouth to speak, which reminds me of a story from my dear friend, Pastor Edmund Chan from Singapore. One day he got up in the morning and he found that he couldn't walk. He had a very painful foot. And uh, this is a story he told me. And uh, he had acute gout. But he was due to preach in Skyline Church that weekend. And so, not knowing what else to do, he got into his wheelchair, was wheeled eventually to the, at the airport terminal, caught his plane and disembarked in KK yeah, uh, on a wheelchair. And there he was, joined the immigration queue at KK Airport in a wheelchair. And one of his church members, who happened to be on the same flight, saw him there and said, Hey, Pastor Edmund, what are you doing here? Well, said Edmund Chan, I'm here to speak at Skyline. He said, What's happened to your foot? Why are you in a wheelchair? He said, I've got a cute gout. I can't walk. I can't stand. He says, You can't walk. You can't stand. Yeah. You can preach, huh? Edmund turned to him and gave the classic reply. He said, preaching, I use my mouth. Standing, I use my foot, which is the case in point. So why does this passage actually say he opened his mouth to teach and said, why does he do that again and again? Let me assure you again and again that when he says it, he's not actually making a redundant statement. It is not what in English we call a tautologous statement. Actually, Matthew is not there to, to sigh like a hey because by doing it chong hey in order to sap like a hey to sao hey. It's not like that. If you don't understand your Cantonese and you know, you're not very familiar with it, it means that Matthew is not using the sentence to actually being, be long winded to exasperate you. He's not doing that at all. Actually, that phrase means two things. It means, firstly, that Jesus was embarking on a solemn and serious formal utterance. He was there to teach something serious and formally. How serious? How formally? It is like the Kung Fu master imparting his secret move to his disciples. And they are hanging on every word he says and watching his every motion. That's what it means. It is something very serious and solemn. It's like the master of the host of ceremonies in a real-life TV reality show like Survivor or uh, The Biggest Loser or MasterChef coming up at the end to decide who is going to be eliminated. And as he stands up there, all the competitors are listening intently for the little bit of clue to know if they will be eliminated or they get to stay on the show. It is that kind of picture, that kind of atmosphere when he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. The second thing it denotes is that it denotes that he opened his heart. When a master does this, he's opening his heart. It's like the Kung Fu master, he's telling him the secret, that, that the one thing that's on his heart, he's opening his heart. And therefore, in the Sermon on the Mount, we get to see, we get to really look into the depth of the heart of Jesus. His incredible, credible purity, his inc infinitely high moral standards, his incredible, just, compassionate, compassionate heart, filled with love. You get a depth to look into his heart. And here, in this, he's inviting his disciples to be part and parcel of his heart's journey so that they can take this journey with him. You know, not just like, not as obedient, a new set of laws, but to take a journey with him, walking with him out of an intimate relationship with him, to be co-journeyers with him in his kingdom manifesto. 
in the king's new Magna Carta. And that is the solemnness of the teaching. So that you get the idea. These were not flippant kind of remarks, just tossed from time to time. He sat down formally and he taught them, probably over several moments, over several instances. But it was formal and he opened his heart. So this morning, I'd like to take firstly an overview of the Sermon on the Mount before I launch into the Beatitudes. You know, over the next few weeks or months, some of the Skyline pastors, they will be following together with me, taking you through uh, the whole discourse of the Sermon on the Mount. And when you come to certain segments, you will be intrigued, you will be blessed, you will be challenged, you will be shocked by what the Sermon of the Mount says. And sometimes when we come to a part, we, we sometimes feel, what does this mean? We get caught in the details without seeing the whole picture. And that's why as we begin, I want to give you firstly a general survey, a, a kind of overview of the Sermon on the Mount, so that we don't miss the wood for the trees. So that those of us who lo love chocolates, we don't miss the box of chocolates, just because we concentrate on the individual chocolates. You know, sometimes... A box of chocolates is open up and we're like, oh, so nice. The wrappers are nice. The colors are nice. The particular designs are so nice. I like this. I like this. And we, we, we try the chocolate. And then we forget the big picture of the box of chocolates. Why was the chocolate given to us in the first place? By whom? With what affection? What was the relationship? Why? We forget the person. We forget the love. We forget the occasion. We forget the thoughts that's behind it. We forget what this whole box of chocolates actually signify. And it's easy for that to happen in the Sermon on the Mount. We get into the individual things and we forget what is this whole thing about. I would like to tackle, tackle the overview of the Sermon on the Mount in three topics, in three themes. Firstly, the splendor of the Sermon on the Mount. Secondly, the shock of the Sermon on the Mount. And thirdly, the Savior in the Sermon on the Mount. The splendor the shock, and the saviour. Let's firstly talk about the splendour of the Sermon on the Mount. And I'd like to take uh, you through the splendour, the wonderful things you see in the Sermon on the Mount. But let me first say that the Sermon on the Mount is not a universal code of ethics for society or for the unconverted world. It is really for Christians because Jesus was addressing His disciples. It is God's way of life for Christians, living under the Lordship of Christ. Hear that again. The Sermon of the Mount is not a universal code of ethics, a new kind of ethical code, a new kind of moral ten commandments for society at large or for the world at large. It is God's way of life for Christians living under the Lordship of Christ. That means when Jesus says, when you see my followers, this should characterize them. Wow. When you go into the Sermon on the Mount, then you realize there are certain things that it really challenges us. And I want to take you through them. Firstly, the splendor of the Sermon on the Mount. Let me just take you through four areas of the splendor very quickly. Um, you know, we read about it in the Beatitudes, but actually many of you will know the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 to 7. I don't have time to read through the whole thing, but you will go through them in the course of the next few weeks and months. Firstly, it covers our relationship to people and to the rest of the world. Jesus said, don't murder. And many of us think that don't murder means don't physically kill people. But Jesus said, if you say to, you get angry with somebody, you insult somebody, you say hurtful things to somebody, and you say to them, raka, we'll come to it when we, we understand what the word raka actually means in Aramaic, then you are guilty of murder. If murder is wrong, then the seeds that lead to murder, anger and hatred is wrong. That's what he's saying. So he says, firstly, don't murder. And he then addresses the root of murder, anger, bitterness, hatred. He just addresses it. He says, don't murder. Because when you do that, the, beginning, the moment you begin to curse them, you're beginning to murder. And people, we begin to realize, wow, that's a very tall order. Then he says, do not judge. Not in the sense that we shouldn't discern and criticize other people. Because, because if, if we can't criticize, then basically the whole Bible, half the Bible should be thrown away because the Bible actually critiques our lives. But he says, don't do it with this attitude of censuring people without humility and love. Don't do it. Don't like write people off with condemnation. 
So he's again getting to the root of the matter. So he's, that's what he means. Do not judge. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Then he says, not just in the way you relate to other people, but in the way you relate to the world. Be salt and light in the world. What is salt? Well, salt was a preservative long before it became a flavor. And when we get to that passage, we'll explore it again. Long before it became a flavor, it was a preservative. It was there to stop decay and stop things from falling apart. And Jesus said that in the world, there'll be many things that are falling apart. There's violence, there's crime, there's sickness, there's death, there's leprosy, there's pandemics. But Jesus said this, wherever you see these things, the whole world will be running away from these things. My people will move for the wisest way to get into those things and to be there. Be salt and light. That's what he said. That's why when you look back at the history of Christianity, say in India, in the last first 200 years of Christianity, the first people to be converted in India were the untouchables and those with leprosy. Because when the world was fleeing them, the Christians were in there first. That's the first thing he says. Secondly, he talks about our integrity in our speech and in our sexual life. He says, don't swear at all. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. He said, you know, everything you say, including off-the-cuff comments, things you make just, you know, by the way kind of remarks, some sort of callous words you say, let every word you say be as if that it was actually said with integrity and truth as though you're swearing on a stack of Bibles. That's what he said. We're like, wow. Immediately we feel, you know, where am I in this relation to this? And you know, because we, we say all kinds of things. What was he trying to get at? He was trying to get at our hearts. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, that is the radical way the Sermon of the Mount goes. And then he said, don't have sex outside covenant of marriage. Don't commit adultery. What was he trying to do? Jesus was trying to bring integrity of mind and soul and our spirits together with our bodies. He said... Don't have sex. Don't show your nakedness to somebody. Don't share your nakedness with somebody you're not prepared to do life with. If you are physically naked, you must be prepared to be personally naked in a covenant relationship. Anything other than that is a disintegrity. You're separating the body from who you really are. Then the third thing he talks about is our attitude to our enemies and to the poor. And again, it's very radical. He says, love your enemies, and if your enemies strike you on the right cheek, you turn the other. Wow, that's incredible. You will come to it when we come to it. Again, you will find out what it means to be struck on the right cheek. Because if you think about it, in the ancient days, everybody has to be right-handed. If you're left-handed, your teachers and your parents will make sure you become right-handed. Okay, because left-handed people are seen as a perversion or anomaly. Okay, that was in the ancient days. So everyone strikes right-handed. How can you strike right hand, right somebody's right cheek? Cannot. The only way you can strike somebody's right cheek with the right hand is if you go backhanded. Bang. And that's the greatest insult. You can slap two ways in the Middle East. This way, forward or backwards. The greatest insult is backwards where you say, you know, you are nothing. You are just filth. That's how you do it. When somebody strikes you on the right, people think, oh, does that mean that Christians are passive? You know, you turn the other cheek. No. When you come to it, you'll realize that when you turn the other cheek, you are approaching the other person in love to try to reconcile the situation, but showing the other person that it is wrong. But I'll still give you my other cheek, my left cheek, for you to strike properly if you want. But what you did was wrong. So you will come to it. And that's how we love our enemies. We correct with truth and love. How do we do that? Again, we will get to the details when we get to the Sermon on the Mount. We give without self-congratulations. You know, give to the poor. Jesus says when you give to the poor, when you do charity, don't announce to the whole world. Many of us, we give to the poor. We want to announce. We want to tell people. You know, what we, hey, by the way, this doesn't apply to our Faith Promise Day or Anniversary Gift Day. Okay, so that you know. Because nobody knows how much people give. Nobody knows. We just know as a church we collected that much. Thank you very much. God bless you. It's a faith thing. But in terms of individual, nobody knows. I don't even know. I don't. God knows. But God says, Jesus says this. When you give, don't self-congratulate. Don't give with 
condescension, with pride, with arrogance, that these people who are poor need your help and therefore you give it in a, in a way. Give without knowing your right hand and your left hand don't, don't know what they do. Without your right hand knowing what the left hand is doing. That's what he says. What does it mean? It means that, you know what? You don't give in self-congratulation. You know when you are, your right hand knows what your left hand is doing? You are like that holding on all the time. You know? Or put the Chinese hand together. Wow, you know, you, you know everybody knows you've done a good deed, you know? It, it's so that you don't. Your right hand doesn't know your left hand. In other words, you don't have any sense of self-congratulation. Any sense of self-knowledge even. That means you treat the poor as exactly as you would treat somebody who is different from you. The, the same, because they're made in the image of God. You don't treat them with condescension, with pride, with arrogance, with paternal, uh, paternalistic, patronizing attitude. You treat them with respect. And you give, because that's Jesus', that's Jesus way of giving. You give without self-congratulations. And the fourth area is our true treasure house is measured by our money, and our prayer. Where do you store your money? Where's the storehouse for our money? Jesus says. You know, we know what the storehouse for our money is. It's the place where you spend money very easily without even thinking about it. For me, it's books. I, you know, I, I love books. I just spend money without even thinking about it. For some of you, it's holidays. For others of you, it's handbags and shoes. Others, it's fast cars or something like that. Whatever it is, those are the things that stand the chance of being your God. Because that's where your storehouse is. That's where you're, this is where. Some of you, it's your bank. Some of you, it's your shares, your bonds that you're buying, your gold. That's where your storehouse is. Because to buy gold, to buy shares, to buy bank, to buy property, very easy. But to come to give 10% to tithe, or 15%, or 20%, you struggle. You really struggle. Jesus says, where your treasure is, that's where your God is. And for many of us, Actually, our God and is an idol closer to us than we think, even though we may be Christians. And then the second thing Jesus says is the way you... So when you actually know how to give, you won't worry even about the future. There will be generosity in your heart. You won't be anxious about what you eat or drink. You won't be. Because that's not your storehouse. God is your storehouse. So what about prayer? Well, what do you do when you are alone? How do you know who your true God is? Who do you speak to when you are alone? Well, some people find it very hard to speak to God. They find solitude very challenging for them. I want to say this, depth of prayer, deep, deep prayer, is a mark of where your true storehouse is in God. So, you know, whenever we find radical generosity a challenge, whether we find deep prayer in solitude a challenge, we are probably putting our storehouse and our God and our idol somewhere else other than God. When we get there, you will be challenged in these areas as well. So these are four areas that the Sermon on the Mount talks about. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount as a whole, we find it is a life of joyful divestiture. We're divesting. We're constantly shedding. Shedding things. We're sh having less. We're shedding our reputation. We're shedding our wealth. We're shedding our influence. We're shedding our comfort. We're just, we're just shedding. That's a kind of a life. At the same time, there's integrity in our speech and in our sex life. And then that's at the same time, we love people and treat them with respect because we become aware that everyone is created in the image of God. Whether they are morally different from us, racially different from us, demographically different from us, or you know, have a personality that we can't stand, we treat them with respect and love. Because they created the image of God. And we love God so much so that we never worry about the physical things per se. Because our storehouse is in God. And God will get it right. And we are never stingy in the way we give and the way we pray. If we live like that, the Sermon on the Mount says, we will be like light to the world. We will together will be like a city on a hill. And everybody's excited. Can somebody say amen? We will be like that. And we get excited about being, you know, lights to the world and the city on a hill with bright lights because the world will see and the world will be transformed. But then we realize it is totally beyond us. Totally, totally beyond us. And that we will never fully understand the Sermon on the Mount until we understand the next thing about the Sermon on the Mount, the shock of it. 
the terrible shock, the Sermon on the Mount comes to us. And here's the second point, the shock of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, when I was growing up many, many years ago, when I was a student, I used to hear people say words like this. They said, you know what? We don't need all this Christianity. We don't need all these things. We are scientific people today. We, we don't need miracles, the virgin birth, the death and resurrection of Jesus. We don't have to believe all these things. We don't have to believe in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for the sins of the world. What we need is something beautiful like the Sermon on the Mount. If we have the Sermon on the Mount and everybody obeys the Sermon on the Mount or the equivalent of it in your own religion, this world will be a better place. And one person who actually spoke like that was Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi, the leader and the father of Indian independence, when he went to Britain to negotiate the uh, independence of India, he met with great hostility and they had all kinds of questions and all kinds of threats and all kinds of violence was threatened against the whole movement. And Gandhi said these words. He said, when your country and mine shall sit together or get together on the teachings laid down by Christ in this Sermon on the Mount, we shall have solved the problems not only of our countries, but those of the world. He was a great admirer of Jesus, a great admirer of the Sermon on the Mount, and he thought the Sermon on the Mount, just like many people, is a nice moral ethical code for an unconverted society. It's a great way, it's a great moral code for the world to live, he thinks. But you know, many people who actually see the Sermon on the Mount like that, and many Christians too, they think it's really nice, it's good. Just like many people in the world think 1 Corinthians 13 is nice on love. Or Psalm 23 is very nice. You ask them, they say, oh, it's very beautiful. They see it in the same way about the Sermon on the Mount. It's nice, it's wonderful teaching of Jesus. They think it's a great moral, ethical code for society. And many Christians too. They think that's all there is. Three chapters, 107 verses of just great teaching. Very good. It's a bit romantic, but idealistic. It's a great teaching. Until it shocks us. Because the only way you can take it seriously is when it actually shocks you. Let me tell you the story of Virginia Stem Owens. Virginia Stem Owens was a professor in a university in Texas teaching English literature. And one day she gave an assignment to her students to write an essay on the Sermon on the Mount. She thought in Texas, you know, most of the students who have heard about the Sermon on the Mount, or maybe, you know, you know, read the Bible here and there, heard about the Sermon on the Mount in Sunday school or whatever. She was absolutely shocked that the majority of her students had never ever read the Bible or heard about the Sermon on the Mount, or if they did, they were largely unfamiliar with it. And so she waited for the essays to come back. And when she got the essays back, she was absolutely shocked. What was the response from the students? They hated it. They absolutely revolted against it. They were repelled by it. And these are some of the excerpts. Excerpts from one student was... I do not like the essay on the Sermon on the Mount. It was hard to read and made me feel like I had to be perfect, and no one is. Another excerpt. The things asked in this sermon are absurd. To look at a woman as adultery? That is the most extreme, stupid, and unhuman statement I have ever heard. That's what they said. Initially, Virginia Stem Williams was, was shocked, and then she thought to herself, what does all this mean? And she came to this conclusion. She said, biblical illiteracy had finally come home to roost. These were not atheist students looking to fight Christians. They were merely students looking at this from a home down hedonism. They're just pleasure seeking. They're unfiltered by 2,000 years of cultural haze. They had never read the Bible before. And they hated what they read. They were shocked by it. It terrified them. It condemned them. And this reminds me of the words of the great Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who preached on the Sermon on the Mount in the 1940s and 50s, and who then, whose, whose teachings were then compiled in a book. It's about 600 plus pages of studies in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the greatest books written on the Sermon on the Mount. I know I had a pleasure as a student to meet this great man and to hear him preach and to shake his hands. He's one of the guys who has actually influenced my own life as a Christian and as a teacher of the Word. You pick up the, the, the book on studies in the Sermon on the Mount by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and this is what he said. 
he said these words. He says, anyone who says how wonderful the Sermon on the Mount is and how it can cure the problems of the world has never really read it. If you look at what it really says and grasp it, you will cry out, God, save me from the Sermon on the Mount. Get it away from me. Take it away from me. It exposes me. It reveals me. It condemns me. And until you feel the shock and the terror of the Sermon on the Mount, you have not really seen what it is saying. But why does it terrorize us like that? You read it. It will terrorize you. If you truly are a follower of Jesus, it will terrorize you. Why does it terrorize us like that? It is because when we read it, you know, we read it, we know that that is exactly how we want other people around us to live. Always kind, always compassionate, never cheating us, always good, always loving. You know, you know always speaking the truth in love to us. We, that's how we want other people to live. We suddenly realize that all our lives we've been demanding other people should live like that. So now we know. Deep down inside, all of us know that is how we should be living. We know it. Because those are the absolute standards we set for other people. Why do we set this? Because deep down inside, we know that's how we should be living. And when it hits us, we suddenly realize we fall infinitely, impossibly short of the Sermon on the Mount. And then it terrorizes us. What's our reaction to this? And many people, including Christians, when they come across the Sermon on the Mount, what's their reaction? Their reaction is some feel absolutely disgusted by it. Some feel condemned by it. There are people who argue with it. They ridicule it. They criticize it. They say, this is silly. This is idealistic. Jesus didn't mean what he said he did. There must be other explanations for this. Impossible for people to live this life. Martin Lloyd-Jones had this to say. He says, if you find yourself arguing with a servant on the mount or criticizing it, then your interpret either your interpretation of it is wrong or you, there is something wrong with you. Listen to this. Either your interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount is wrong or there is something not right with your heart. If you find yourself criticizing it, arguing with it, ridiculing it, consigning it to idealism, then he add these words. He said the Sermon on the Mount is a very terrible sermon, meaning it strikes terror in everyone who were to read it and understand it. So we see the glorious splendor of the Sermon on the Mount. Then we get shocked by the earth-shattering terror of the Sermon on the Mount to us. So how now do we embrace the Sermon on the Mount? One part of it is so grand and, and so splendor, and splendorous and glorious and, and we are just drawn to it and then we get repelled by it because it strikes terror within us. How do we apply it to our lives? You see, the only way you and I can apply the Sermon on the Mount to our lives is if we know, and here's the third point, the Savior in the Sermon, in the sermon on the Mount. If we know the Savior. It's the only way. Why? Because long before you can do any of these things, you and I must be changed. If we don't have something outside of us that changes from the inside, there is no way we can do any of these things. It's beyond us. We must be transformed. And when we look at this, there must be someone whose life comes into us beyond our, the existence of our limited lives and our sin-soaked life and our limited lives and to change us from inside out. See, the Beatitudes, which is an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, that's how it starts, to the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes start in the right way. It's exactly for the start of the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes should be there because they should be there. Why? Because the Beatitudes describe what a Christian must be and the attitudes he or she must have before he or she can live out the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. You get it? That's what the Beatitudes is. What we must be and the attitudes we must have. And so how does that work? Something must change from inside, guys. It cannot be outside conduct. It cannot be just trying to fake it. There's no way you can fake it. You see, if you look at the Beatitudes, you look at the Beatitudes now as we start. You know, Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means we are spiritually bankrupt. That's what it means. 
Who are the people who are poor in spirit? There's only one group of people who are poor in spirit in the entire universe. Christians. And those who are becoming Christians. Nobody else knows what it means. Let me explain what poor in spirit it means. It means you and I are spiritually bankrupt. See, most of us, we live our lives saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a bad person. I've got good deeds. Yeah, I've got bad deeds. Like everybody else. And we're just a bit humble about some of our bad deeds. And many religious people are like, they're humble about their bad deeds. You know, we are bad. So we try to do a little more, more good deeds to God. It's like saying, I have money in the bank, you know. Yeah, I've got debts, but I've got money in the bank. And when I see God, I say to God, God, you know what? Yeah, I've got debts. I've done bad things. But look, I've got some money in my bank. All I need is a top up and I'll be fine. And that's how religion goes. But the Christian is the only person who knows he's got no money in the bank. He's spiritually, absolutely bankrupt. All his good deeds, even he has good deeds, were done with bad intentions and wrong intentions and personal ambitions and personal selfishness. They don't even count. Blessed are the poor in spirit. See, and that is reflected in the song, you know. Augustus Top Lady actually wrote this song. Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Nothing in my hands I bring. We are spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are those who mourn. When you know you're spiritually bankrupt, you moan. You cry out to God. You need total repentance you need a savior. Blessed are the meek. And what does a meek mean? It means you have no power to recommend ourselves to God. We stand before God. We have no power to recommend ourselves until a savior recommends us. We have no power. We know it. We know it. You know, in Malaysia, sometimes they say it's not who, you know, it's not what the rule of the law is, it's who you know. People ask, there's a common question in Malaysia do you have any strings to pull? Do you know somebody here? Do you have some influence? The Christian is somebody who stands before God. He can have done a million good things in his life, but he stands before God. He has no power to recommend himself to God. That's what it means. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. What does that happen? It comes from seeing him. It comes from seeing Him. You know, we, 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 come to, we come to a relationship with Jesus and we see Him. We see Him in all His glory, His beauty, His moral standards which are so infinitely high, His justice, His love, His compassion, His peace that passes all understanding. And you know, when people see this, some people get revolted by this. They want to turn away from this. But when the Christian sees this, he thirsts for it. He longs for it. He himself knows he's filthy. But there's something in him that drives him that he longs to, to, for this life. He longs for this righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. It comes from seeing him. My friends, have you seen him as your righteousness? See, the Beatitudes are this. Because Beatitude, blessed. You know, blessed, blessed, blessed. Blessed means, you know, some translations is translated happy. It's, it's not. It's a very superficial word. That's why I don't like some of these modern translations. Happy is the man. No, it's, blessed means favored and envied. You're so favored. People look at you and say, wow, I wish I could be like you. They want to emulate you. The beatitude profile profiles a savior, hero whom we want to emulate, who is poor in spirit, who is meek, who moans. This is a hero, who is righteous, who is merciful. And, and when we think about it, we think the beatitudes is describing us until we realize before the beatitudes describe you and I, it is describing him. See, the beatitudes bring us to Jesus. That's the starting point. He spoke these words, but it brings us back to him. You want to understand the Sermon on the Mount? You got to understand Jesus. You got to hunger and thirst after him. So that's the only way we can be rich as king. Why can we rich? We be rich as kings because he became spiritually poor for us. I'm not talking about economic richness. I'm talking about the spiritual richness because he became spiritually. He divested himself of everything and emptied himself. 
Why can't we be favored and glad? Because he moaned. He suffered. He bled and died. That's why we are favored. That's why we are blessed. Why can't we inherit the earth? Because he became meek and disinherited the glory of heaven and the splendor of heaven and came down and emptied himself and became nothing for us. Why can't we be filled? Because he emptied himself. And became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Why can we obtain mercy? Because he took God's wrath on himself when the Father turned away. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that God's wrath would not come onto you and to me. Why is it that we can see God? Because he removed the veil of sin that separates us from the Father. Why can we be pure in heart? We know we are not pure, but why does God look at us and see us that we can be pure in heart? Because He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what God has done for us. And that's what we must understand that Jesus has done. You see, the splendor of the Sermon on the Mount, if we are truly reading it, will shock us eventually. After the splendor, it will lead us to the shock of the Sermon on the Mount because we fall so infinitely short and that will lead us to the Savior in the Sermon on the Mount. And His name is Jesus. I don't know who you're listening to right now, where you're listening from, but today God is speaking to you. Whether you're here in this sanctuary or you're listening in your living room at home, God is speaking to you. And you may say, Pastor Philip, I want to know this wonderful Jesus who lived this sinless life, who went to the cross and died for my sins. And now He calls me on a journey to live in a relationship of obedience and surrender to Him. And in living this, the Bible says this, when you choose to live this life in Him, not by your efforts, you are blessed. Blessed are those who want. You are favoured. You become a light that people want to either envy or follow or emulate. You are blessed because the blessings of God come upon you. And whether you're listening from, if you say, Pastor, I'd like to just give my heart to Jesus. I want to invite you today to give your heart to Jesus. Whether you're sitting in this sanctuary or at home or listening somewhere else right now, will you pray this prayer with me to receive Jesus into your life? Pray it following me. Let's pray it together. Dear Jesus, thank you for showing me God's standards in the Sermon on the Mount. I know I fall totally short of your glory and standards. Please forgive my sins. Take away every condemnation, Lord, in my heart. Today, I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations because you've opened the door of your heart to Jesus and He's come into your heart. Today, a new life has come into your heart. And in a short while at the closing, somebody will tell you how to get in touch with us and connect with us so that you can begin your new life together. Please stay on listening because we'll give you some details to connect with you. We'll love to connect with you, to know you better, to give you something to help you to begin your new life in God's kingdom. Amen. And I want to pray for every one of us here, whether you're listening from home or whether you're on site right now. If today God has spoken to your heart and you know this is where God wants to reign, in your heart first, I want you to lift up your hand right now where you are, where you're seated here or in your living room. Lift up your hand as a sign of surrender to the Lord. I want to pray for you today because the kingdom of God wants to come into your heart. Father God, thank you for everyone here who has heard your voice and Holy Spirit, I thank you. You've spoken to each one. Some of us are sick. Some of us need healing in our bodies. And I pray right now for the blood of Jesus to bring healing to your bodies 
and the bodies of your loved ones right now. I pray for joy to come into your home, healing to come into your home, and to come into your family right now in the name of Jesus. Some of you are facing challenges, whether it's financial or relational, or even, you know, with sleeplessness in your own hearts because you are the storm raging in your life and stuff going on. I don't know, but God knows. The blood of Jesus avails for you. Will you surrender your life to the King of Kings and live not by your own law, by your own know-how, but by His kingdom manifesto? Exchange your life for His life in you. And I pray, God, that as each heart opens to you today, they will begin this kingdom journey that you spoke to us about in the Sermon on the Mount, which is alive today. And when we do, I speak God's word into your life that you are blessed. Your family is blessed. The generations that follow you as you commit your life to Jesus and as they do so, they are blessed. Can somebody say an amen to that? And I speak that favor over your life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Sunday. Have a wonderful week. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Pastor. Wow. Um, if you prayed that prayer, we just want to give you uh, some ways that you can get in touch with us. There's going to be a QR code on the screen right now that you can scan. Um, it's coming up right now. Yeah. And um, this is a significant moment in your life. If you prayed that prayer, this is a significant moment in your life. And we want to be there for you. So uh, scan the QR code. Let us know uh, that you prayed that prayer. Or even if you are not sure whether you want to commit you know, you're not sure whether you want to give your life to Christ. Scan it anyways. Let us know. Let us know what your, your thoughts are, what your questions are. We want to be there for you in any way we can.